This is Radio 3, it's 29 minutes to 8. Next, our Sunday play, and we present Bertolt Brecht's The Life of Galileo, in a version by David Hare. The Life of Galileo was started in 1938, but revised in 1945, to reflect the growing concerns about the ethical responsibilities of scientists in the wake of the Second World War, and especially the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Life of Galileo by Bertolt Brecht in a new version by David Hare with Richard Griffiths as Galileo. the milk down there, but don't shut the books. Mother says we must play the milkman who'll be making a circle round our house. Uh, you don't make a circle, you describe it. Whichever. Whereas when Signor Cambione the bailiff comes straight for us, what sort of line will he make between two points? The shortest. Correct. I've got something for you. Look behind the star charts. What is it? It's a model. It's a model of how men have always believed the solar system works. Show me. Uh, uh, start by describing it. In the middle, there's a small stone. Yes, that's the Earth. Then round it, there are rings. One inside the other, like globes. How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Yes. Those are the crystal spheres. Stuck to the rings a little ball. Yeah, the stars. Then there are strips of wood with words painted on them. What words? The names of the stars. Such as? The lowest ball is the moon, mm -hmm. and above that's the sun. Yes. Now, make the sun move. It's beautiful, but we're so shut in. Yes. Yet that's what I felt the first time I saw it. Some of us do feel that. For 2,000 years, men have believed that the sun and all the stars revolve around mankind. The Pope, the Cardinals, the princes, the captains, the scholars, the merchants, the fishwives, even the schoolboys, <laughs> have all believed themselves to be sitting dead still at the center of a crystal globe. But now, suddenly, we're moving. The whole planet is moving. For the last hundred years, it's as if mankind itself has been poised, waiting, stuck away in his corner. And now, the moment is here. At last, we're able to say, just because something is so, it doesn't mean to say it shall remain so forever. Everything is in motion again. I like to think it started with the ships. For as long as we can remember, the ships hugged the shore. Then suddenly, they began to set sail straight out across the seas. And on our old continent, a great rumor started. There are new continents. And the oceans we'd so feared turned out to be puddles. A great hunger has grown up in all of us to know the reason for everything. Why a stone falls when you drop it. Why it rises when you throw it in the air. Every single day we discover something new. When I was a young man in Siena, I stood in the street and watched a couple of builders. In just five minutes argument, they'd invented a system of ropes and pulleys. Without even knowing it, they had replaced the method for moving granite blocks which men had used for a thousand years. There and then, in that street, I knew. The old age is gone, a new age is here. Soon mankind will know the truth about his home, about the very earth on which we make our lives, and what is written in the books no longer satisfies us. Once there was belief, but now in its place there is doubt. Now we say, yes, but we know what it says in the books, but why don't we just see for ourselves? <laughs> I predict in our lifetime we will hear astronomy talked about in the marketplace. We always believed the stars were fixed in a crystal vault which was there to stop them falling down. But now we've found the courage to let them soar through space, unfettered and free. Free and unfettered as our ships, speeding across the surface of the earth. Everyone and everything on the earth is moving. 
Our ships are moving, our planets are moving. Even in chess, our rooks have lately taken to zooming right across the board. <laughs> uh, now, what does the poet say? Oh, early morning of beginnings. Oh, early morning of beginnings. Oh, breath of wind from new and distant shores. Yes. And you better drink your milk. There'll be people here soon. Yes. Mm. You understand what I told you yesterday? About Kippernickers? Yes. How can I understand it? I'm only 11 next October. But it's you that I'm working for. You are why I buy expensive books rather than pay the milkman so that you and people like you may understand. But it doesn't make sense. <sighs> I wake up, the sun is there. I go to sleep and it's over there. I see it move. Don't tell me it doesn't. You see? What do you see? You don't see, you gawp. Gawping isn't seeing. Uh, look, this bucket is the sun. Now, sit in this chair. Now, <clears throat> which side is the sun, to your left or to your right? Left. Left. And how may it get to your right? Well, if you move it, of course. Uh, yeah. Isn't there any other way? Hey! 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 <laughs> now, which side is the cell? On your left or on your right? On the right. And uh, did it move? Not really. So what did move? Well, I did. The wrong idiot, not you. The chair. But I went with it. But the chair is the earth and you're sitting what on it. What on earth are you doing with my son, Signor Galileo? Uh, I'm teaching him to see, Signora. Oh, by carting him round the room. Oh, don't, Mother, you don't understand. Oh, no, of course not. You do, I suppose. Mm. Here, another young gentleman who needs tuition, very well dressed, and with a letter of introduction. Mm. Uh, you'll soon have Andrea believing that two and two make five. He already muddles up everything you tell him. Yesterday he was actually trying to prove the earth goes round the sun. He says a man called Kippernickus has worked it out. It's true, isn't it? Kippernickus did work it out. Oh. As a result of our investigation, Signora Sarti, and after bitter dispute, your son and I have made discoveries we can no longer withhold from the world. A new age is born. A new age in which it's a joy to be alive. Then do me a favour, please, Signor, and take this student. I am hoping to pay the milkman in this new age. Well, at least let me drink it before I pay for it. Oh. So, you did believe what I told you yesterday? No, I'd have said it to upset her, but oh. it isn't true. Isn't it? No, it can't be. Why not? I sat and worked it out. If the earth turns, as you say, like this, yeah. then at night it'll be upside down. No, no look, <laughs> this apple is the earth. Oh no, no apples. You can prove anything with an apple. All right. It's all so easy once you start being clever like that. What does it mean? The apple is the earth. It means nothing. Well, perhaps you just don't want to learn. All right. Why am I not upside down at night? Oh, look, this is the earth. And this little splinter is you on it. Now, the earth rotates. And I'm upside down. No, no, no. Look, where's your head? There, down below. Why? Aren't your feet still on the ground? Then why don't I feel the earth turn? Because you're turning with it. You and everything around you is turning together. That's brilliant. That's going to make her really annoying. <sighs> Good morning, Signor. Oh, my God, this place is getting like a chicken shed. My name is Ludovico Marsili. Ah, ah, and you've um, come from Holland, eh? Mm, where I heard much of you, Signor Galilei. Your family owns estates in the Campania. My mother wanted me to have a look round the world, <laughs> see what's going on. Uh, when in Holland they told you I was what was going on? My mother wants me to understand science. <laughs> science is ten scudi a month. Very good, Signor. What are your interests? Horses. Ah. I have no real gift for learning. <laughs> in that case, 15, Scoody. That's fine. It'll have to be first thing in the morning. That's your loss, Andrea. He's paying, you're not. All right, I'm off. Can I have the apple? Certainly not. Go on, of course you can. You'll have to bear with me. The little I know, science and common sense don't mix. Well, for instance, at the moment in Amsterdam, they're selling a tube. 
just a casing of green leather and two lenses. One curved this way, one curved that way. One um, uh, enlarges and one uh, diminishes. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, any sensible person would think they'd cancel each other out. But you look through it and everything's five times as big. Everything? Mm, you can see anything. A church spire, a bird. Well, you yourself have looked through and seen church spires enlarged? Yes, senor. And the tube had two lenses? Mm -hmm. Um, it looks something like, uh, like this. Yes. Well, how old is this discovery? Oh, I've no idea. But it had only been on the market a few days when I left. Yeah. Uh, look, are you sure about physics? I mean, why not horse breeding instead? My mother wants me to. Science is all the rage nowadays, you know. Yes, but dead languages are so much easier. Or, or, or theology, even. Yeah, all right, well, come along Tuesday morning, first thing, right? Thank you, senor. Mm. Senor. Uh, don't look at me like that. I took him on, didn't yes, I? Well, only because she saw me. The Chancellor of the University's outside. Oh, excellent. Bring him in. There's mm. 500 scudi in it, and I shan't need any pupils at all. Yes, ah, morning, Chancellor. Lend us half a scudo. Uh, Signora Sarti, could yes. you uh, send Andrea down to the spectacle makers for these lenses? Here are the particulars. Very good, sir. I have called, Signor, to discuss your application for an increase in salary to a thousand scudi. Ah. Sadly, I cannot recommend it to the university. I cannot manage on five hundred scudi. <laughs> As I understand it, Signor, you give two lectures a week, each of only two hours' length. Your exceptional reputation must, meanwhile, bring you all the private pupils you wish. Signor, I have far too many. Hmm? I teach and teach, but when do I have any time to learn? I'm not clever like these gentlemen that teach philosophy. I am stupid. My problem is I know nothing at all, so I must fill in the gaps in my knowledge. And to do that, I need time. Mm. Signor, mm. mine is a discipline still thirsting for knowledge. In answer to great questions, we still know nothing for sure. We need proof. But how can I find the proof if all my time is being consumed by wealthy idiots who cannot grasp infinity or parallel lives? Please. You should not forget that while, as you keep telling us, the Republic does not pay as much as certain princes, uh, it does, however, guarantee freedom of research. In Padua, we even admit Protestants to our lectures. We offer them degrees. Not only did we not surrender Signor Cremonini to the Inquisition when it was proved to us, oh. proved to Signor Galilei that he had made blasphemous remarks, but we even voted him a higher salary. Throughout Europe, Venice is known as the Republic where the Inquisition has no say. Your people handed Giordano Bruno over to the authorities in Rome because he spread the teachings of Copernicus. Not because he spread the teachings of Copernicus, which are, by the way, untrue. Oh. Untrue, Signor. But because he was not a Venetian, had no tenure here, he did not belong here. It's hardly our fault he was subsequently burnt at the stake. It's good business for you, freedom, isn't it? Hmm? Elsewhere, the Inquisition rules and burns. So here, you get good teachers cheap. You protect us, yes. And in return, you underpay us. I am free, yes. But what use is my freedom without free time? You know the answer, Signor. Do I? Knowledge is a commodity. Oh. It must profit the person who buys it. Oh, I see. Free market free research. Free market in research, is that it? Our Republic's thriving economy hardly strikes me as a subject for mockery, Signor Galilei. Sorry. Nor, as Chancellor of a great university, would I dream of referring to research in so frivolous a tone. Now look to the world and how things are outside these walls. All through Italy, learning groans under the whips of bondage. The country is full of places in which nobody cares how a stone falls. All that interests them is what Aristotle wrote about how a stone falls. Yeah. Now here, we accept you. Here you can research, here you can work. Our exporters need better linen against Florentine competition. They care as much as you do for better science if better science will bring the better looms. Do not despise the market, Signor Galileo. It is the market which brings you your freedom. Admit it. This is a place you can work. Yes, yes, yes. You yes. need money. Invent. 
Something like your famous proportional compasses, which even idiots can use to calculate interest on capital. It's a toy. Yeah, what you call a toy is something which has dazzled and amazed the most eminent men of the Republic. I understand even General Stefano Gritti is able to extract square roots from this instrument. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, in that case, it's a miracle indeed. <laughs> ah, um, perhaps... I do have something of the kind. Excellent, then this is what we need. Signor Galilei, yeah. we know that you are a great man. A great but discontented man, if I may say. Yes, I am discontented. That's what you'd pay me for if you had the wit. I am discontented with myself, but instead you force me to be discontented with you. You allow me no time. You muzzle the oxen's <clears throat> threshers. I'm 46 years old. I've achieved nothing which satisfies then me. Then I shall leave you alone. Thank you. Still not eating that apple. I wanted to show how the world turns. Uh, yeah, um, Andrea, uh, I must tell you something. Um, speak to no one about our ideas. Why not? Because the authorities would not wish it. But it's the truth. Yes, but we cannot prove it. Even the ideas of Copernicus cannot yet be proved. It's just a hypothesis. Give me the lenses. You half scooted into it. I had to leave for my coat. Well, how will you get through the winter without a coat? What's a hypothesis? Oh, uh, when something is likely but cannot be proved. Oh, we look at the stars and we know so little. We see no more than if we were worms. The things we believed in for a thousand years are in the process of collapsing. Their rickety structures at last are giving way. Once there were many laws which explained little. Now we have a new hypothesis. A few new laws hmm, which will explain much. But you've proved them. No, no, no. Only that they may be so. What we have is a beautiful hypothesis, and there's nothing against it. I would like to be a physicist too, Signor Galilei. <sighs> I believe you. An infinity of questions await. Yeah. Take a look at this. Holy Mary! Everything is near. The bells on the campanile. I can read the letters. Gratia Dei! Good. That'll bring us 500. Your Excellency, Noble Signoria, as a humble teacher of mathematics at your University of Padua and director of your great arsenal here in Venice, I have always seen my duty as not only to teach, but also to advance the Republic of Venice by means of practical invention. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With joy, with deference today, I am able to present you with a completely new instrument, my distance glass, my telescope, produced in your world famous great arsenal According to the highest scientific and Christian principles, the product of 17 years of patient research. You. You'll be able to pay the milkman, my friend. Oh, please. Excellency, noble signoria, once again, a Venetian hand writes in the book of history. A world-famous scholar here presents to you, and you alone, a highly saleable cylinder to put on the market in any way you please. And what more has it occurred to you? A weapon with which in wartime we may see our enemy's ships a fall two hours before he sees ours. Oh. And now, Your Excellency August Signoria, Signor Galileo asks you to receive this instrument, this fruit of his brilliance from his very own charming daughter herself. Your Excellency? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get through this charade. Last night, I pointed the tube at the moon. What did you see? It has no light of its own. What? It's a 
<laughs> Astronomy has stood still for a thousand years. It had no telescope. They're speaking to you. I can see everything. Women cannot bathe on the room. Do you know what the Milky Way consists of? No, I do. Ludovico wants to congratulate you, Father. Uh, I, I congratulate you, sir. Well, I have improved it. Oh, I can see that. You've made the cover red. In Holland, it was green. Oh, no. Senor Galilei, you have done as we asked of you. I think we may say all 500 scudi are safe and secure. <laughs> now, do come and meet the senator. Oh, yes. Did I do all right? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, you, you seem fine to me. Then what's wrong? I'm not sure. Perhaps a green cover would have been just as good. I think they are all pleased with Father. And I think I'm learning a little about science. <laughs> The edge of the crescent is uneven. It's jagged, it's rough. Near the luminous edge on the dark half, there are luminous spots. They appear one after the other. From the spots, the light streams out wider, wider, until it merges with the great luminous part. How do you explain them? <laughs> I can't. Well, you must. They're mountains. Well, how can there be mountains on a star? They are giant mountains. Their summits are gleaming in the rising sun while the slopes below them are dark. What you are seeing is the light spreading down from the mountaintops into the valleys below. But this destroys all astronomy for 2,000 years. What you are seeing has been seen by no other eyes but mine. You are the second. The, the moon cannot be an earth with mountains and valleys any more than the earth can be a star. The moon is an earth. The earth is a star. An ordinary heavenly body, just one among thousands. Take another look. What? Is the dark side of the moon completely dark to you? Oh, no. I can see a sort of feeble grey light. <laughs> and where does it come from? Well, <laughs> it's from the Earth. No. Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, how is that possible? There is no light on the Earth. The Earth shines just as the moon shines. It shines by the light from the sun. <laughs> what the moon is to us, we are to the moon. Sometimes to the moon we are full, sometimes a crescent, and sometimes we're not there at all. <laughs> the moon and the Earth are the same. <laughs> but not ten years ago, a man was burnt in Rome. His name was Giordano Bruno, and he said just that. He said it, yes. And now we can see it. Keep your eye there. What you see means there is no difference between heaven and earth. Today is the 10th of January, 1610. In Mankind's Diary, he writes, Heaven abolished. Oh, that is appalling. Perhaps. But let me tell you, I know something more. I... Oh. Give me a signal. I must speak to you in private. Look, uh, I have no secrets from my friend Sagredo here. It is something incredible. My friend is quite well used to the incredible. He spends long periods with me. That wonder, that marvellous thing you invented, it turns out is worthless. What, what do you mean? What you call the fruit of 17 years' research can be bought on any street corner in Italy. Even as we speak, a Dutch cargo ship is unloading 500. Really? Does this not concern you? No, no, please, Senor, I understand. <laughs> ah, but if you will listen... <laughs> We, we cross the sea at vast expense and in great danger. We still need some sort of old clock for the sky. Now, I have reason to believe that with this telescope we may observe the movement of the regular stars. New star charts, Chancellor, and millions of scudi will be saved. I cannot listen. I will not. I showed you nothing but kindness, and you made me a laughing stock in the city of my birth. I shall be remembered forever as the Chancellor who was tricked by a worthless spyglass. Oh, no. Well, may you laugh. You have your 500 scudi, but I am an honest man, and the world disgusts me. I can't help liking that man when he's angry. Did you hear that? A world in which there are no bargains disgusts him. Had you heard about the Dutch? Of course. I mean, oh. yes. Well, in a sense. Oh, what does it matter? 
Mine's twice as good. But I had to do it. I can hardly work with bailiffs in the house. And there's Virginia. It's not long now before she'll need a dowry. She has no brains. Also, I like to buy books. I like to eat decently. It's when I'm eating, th then I can think. Uh, and right now, I am thinking. Uh, come close, I'll show you. Yeah. I have a feeling very like fear. I will show you one of the shining milk-white clouds of the galaxy. There are stars. Countless stars. These are the many worlds. The numberless others. The further stars of which Giordano spoke. But he could not see them. We at last can. But even if the Earth is a star, it still does not prove what Copernicus said, that it revolves round the sun. Yes. Sagredo, I've been wondering. For days, I've been wondering. Now, there is Jupiter. There are four smaller stars close by. I saw them on Monday. Yesterday, I looked again, I could have sworn all four had changed their positions. I noted them. Uh, yes. Now their position is different again. <laughs> What's this? What? I saw four. Look, look. Uh, I see three. The fourth. Where is it? We must find it. We must find the fourth, Segredo. We must sit. We must look, we must find it, we must find out where the fourth one has gone! <gasps> proof! We have proof! The fourth has gone round behind Jupiter, and that's why it cannot be seen. There, a star around which another revolves. And the crystal sphere to which Jupiter is fixed? Yes. How is it possible? How can Jupiter be fixed to anything when other things move around it? It cannot be so. There is no framework in heaven. Oh. Jupiter is simply one more sun. Oh, calm down. You go too fast. Too fast? Oh, come on. Don't you see? They were right. Who? The Copernicans? Yes, they were right, and the whole world was against them. This is something Andrea must hear. <laughs> Senora Sarri! Will you stop screaming like a lunatic? Will you stop standing there like a dead cod? We have found the truth! Well, don't you see? That's what I'm frightened of. What do you mean? Do you really not see? Have you really taken leave of your senses? You go round shouting for everyone to hear the Earth is a star. It is no longer the center of the universe. Yeah, well, soon it'll be obvious to everyone. But where then is God? Eh? God! Where is God? We're not there. Any more than we'd look for him down here if we happen to have been born up there. Then where is God? Oh, I'm not a theologian, I'm a mathematician. No, first and foremost, you're a man. And I ask you, where is God in your universe? In us or nowhere. As the heretic Giordano said. Oh, you, yes, yes, if you like. Oh, that's why he was burnt. No. Not ten years ago. He was burnt because he had no proof. Oh. Signora Sarte. Galileo, I have always thought you a clever man. For 17 years, you have taught the Ptolemaic system which the Church supports and the Scriptures confirm. You did not believe in it, but you taught it. Because I could prove nothing else. And you think proof makes any difference at all? Yes. Yes, since you ask. I also happen to believe in mankind and in his special quality. I believe he has reason, he has common sense. Then I tell you something. I do not believe in it. My forty years on this earth have taught me one thing. Reason counts for nothing at all. Show men the red tail of a comet, stir up their fears and they'll jump over cliffs in a bloody stampede. But tell them one fact, supported by seven clear reasons, and they will simply laugh in your face. How can you love science if that's what you believe? Reason is the thing that keeps us alive! Men don't have reason. They have low cunning. Please never think the two are the same. I'm not speaking of that. I'm not speaking of cunning. I know they call a donkey a horse when they want to sell, and a horse a donkey when they want to buy. That is man's cunning. But I put my trust in something quite else. 
the woman who gives a horse more hay for a journey, the sailor who lays up provisions against the storm, the child who reaches for his cap because he fears it may rain. My trust is in them, for they employ reason in their everyday lives. No one can see me and watch as I drop a stone and say it does not fall. Ultimately, no man is capable of that. The truth finally cannot be resisted, or not for long. It has its own power. Its power cannot be broken. Thinking is one of the great pleasures of being alive. You tell me people cannot grasp the truth, Sagredo, I tell you they thirst for it. Do you want something, senor? Yes, I want Andrea. Andrea's in bed and asleep. Well, can't you wake him? Well, well what do you want him for? Oh, to look through your tube again. Yes, to look through the tube. And for that, you want him woken up in the middle of the night. Have you taken leave of your senses? My child needs his sleep. Oh. Good morning, Father. Why are you up so early? Signora Sati and I are going to early mass. Mm. Ludovico is coming too. What was the night like, Father? Um, yeah, clear. Can I look through the telescope? Why? It's not a toy. No, as you say. Besides, the whole thing's a terrible letdown. That's what everyone says. They sell it in the street for three scooty. And have you seen anything new in the sky? Uh, nothing that would interest you. A few stars, that's all. I'm thinking of approaching the Medicis. What? Asking them to lend their name to my stars. Active sponsorship. Make my stars famous. Why not? I've already decided to move us to Florence. Oh. I've written to the Grand Duke asking if I might be court mathematician. The court? Galileo! Muffin, it's true. It's, it's true. I can hardly go on as I am here. I am in grave need of luxury. I need leisure to work. This stuff here, it is just a start. I have to have time if I am to prove beyond all contradiction that the planets revolve around the sun. Now, if I go to Florence, then I will have the time to find the proof. Proof that will satisfy everyone from Signora Sarti right up to the Pope, if I can get the court to take me. But they have to take you with these new stars of yours. Go to your mass. Yes, Father. Don't. Go to Florence. Oh, why not? It's a monk's town. It's in the church's pocket. There are great scholars at the court of Florence. Doormats. Nothing more. No, even monks are human, Sir Grado. They will succumb to the temptations of truth. Ah, Copernicus gave them only scribblings, but I will give them the evidence of their own eyes. It's not enough for the truth to exist. Truth must also go on to the attack. Now I shall take these monks and force them to look through the telescope. I shall grab them by the neck and drag them down. Galileo, the road you are taking is fearsome. It's a night of disaster when a man sees the truth. Of whom do we say he's going into it with his eyes open? Of the man who knows he is destroying himself. Do you think the Pope will listen when you say he is in error? Do you really think his diary will have the same entry as yours, heaven abolished, January the 10th? If you teach us to be so skeptical in science, why on earth are you so credulous in life? You don't believe in Aristotle, yet you do believe in the Grand Duke of Florence. When I watched you just now at the telescope, when you stood and you said, I believe in reason, these are reasonable men, then I smelt burning flesh. Galileo, I saw you on your own pyre. I love science, but I love my friend more. I beg you. Do not go to Florence. If they want me, I shall go. Oh, nothing but bowing and scraping since we arrived in this great city of Florence. Everyone in town has to see the tube. With me wiping up the floor after them. Yes, well, Mother. Yeah, well, to what purpose, I cannot imagine. Well, if there was anything to be discovered, then the Holy Fathers would know. I was once four years serving a priest. He had leather books right up to the ceiling and not a love story in sight. Mm. Made himself ill from sitting reading all day. Well, if any of this meant anything, then he would have known. Yeah, today's great viewing, well, I think we can safely predict a disaster. I wanted to soften them up with roast lamb and garlic and rosemary, but oh no. 
I have something else for them. Oh, my God, the Grand Duke's here already. And Galileo's still at the university. Oh, your, your Highness, I want to see the telescope. Our apologies. Uh, Signor Galileo, well, he's late. He will arrive. It was Signor Galilei's own wish. It's at his invitation the Grand Duke is here. I know, Signor. His own astronomers will test the existence of the new Medici star. My astronomers say it's all rubbish. Where is the telescope? Uh, in his study through there. Andrea, please take the Grand Duke through. Is this it? Is this the new famous model of the universe? It is. Keep your hands off it. Precious. All right. But you do have to realise I am a Grand Duke, remember? Ah, I apologise for being late, everyone. This is my colleague, Signor Ferrazzoni. Good evening. The court mathematician, court philosopher, you already know. His Highness is waiting. Please, the whole court wants to know what our famous university feels about these amazing new stars. Yeah. <laughs> Signor Galilei. Your Highness. Please, do begin. Uh, your Highness, it will be my privilege to demonstrate my new discoveries to scholars of your university and in your presence as well. <laughs> um, as your Highness is doubtless already aware, we astronomers have lately had very grave problems with our calculations. For years we've used a system which accords with our philosophy, but which sadly does not accord with the facts. Now, according to this Ptolemaic explanation, stars are said to move in extremely complex ways. For instance, Venus follows an orbit of this sort. Yeah, but even if we accept the theory of such complicated movements, <laughs> we still cannot predict where the stars will, in reality, appear. We've never seen able to find them in places where, in principle, they really ought to be. Even worse, some stars perform movements which the Ptolemaic system simply cannot explain. Among these, most notably, we must deal with the question of four smaller stars around Jupiter, which I have recently found. So, I suggest the gentlemen start by stepping forward to the telescope and observing these new Medician stars. Please sit here. Uh, thank you, my child, but I fear things are not as simple as that. Signor Galilei, first, before anything, we must allow ourselves the pleasure of a disputation. I propose the question. Can such planets exist? A formal disputation. I was thinking perhaps you might just take a look. Here? In a moment. I take it you are familiar with the ancient opinion that there can be no stars which revolve round centres other than the Earth, nor any which lack support in the sky. I am. Moreover, quite apart from such stars being possible, I must also ask, as a philosopher, whether such stars are necessary as well. Aristoteles, Davini... No, no, please, 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 please. Uh, do you mind if we continue in our own language? Uh, my, my colleague here does not understand Latin. Oh, really? Does it matter if he understands it or not? I think it does, yes. I thought he was your lens grinder. Signor Ferrazzoni is a lens grinder and a scholar. Thank you, child. Well, if Signor Ferrazzoni insists... Yeah, no, 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 I insist. <sighs> my argument would be considerably less elegant, but there we are. It's your house. <sighs> the universe of the divine Aristotle with the mystical music of its spheres and sublime architecture of its crystal vaults, is the conception of such transparent symmetry and beauty that we do well to pause and tremble before tearing it apart. Yes, well, uh, having done that, shall we take a look? I do have to say, uh, it has occurred to me, if your telescope shows us something which cannot be there, we are entitled to ask what sort of telescope is this? What sort? What sort of telescope? I am not sure I know what you mean. In the absence of reason which you are able to advance for these stars' existence... Reasons? I don't know, just look for yourself. I might suggest, if it would not madden you further, <sighs> And what is in the heavens and what is in your telescope may indeed be two different things. Oh, that could not have been more tactfully put. Are you saying the lens has been painted? Are you saying we painted the stars on the lens? Are you accusing me of fraud? Oh, impossible in the presence of his highness. Uh, your <coughs> instrument is certainly ingenious. 
No, no one for a moment has any doubts about yeah, that. Well, we also know that you most certainly would not wish to bestow the great name of Medici on stars which finally could not be found to exist. Is there something wrong with my stars? Oh, what's the matter with you? They're all stupid! I'm traitor! What a deplorable child. This matter need not delay us. Signor Galilei's argument is fatally flawed. His Jupiter satellites cannot move as he says they do because they would have to smash their way through the crystal spheres. I've got bad news for you. There aren't any spheres. Oh, please, any textbook will tell you then that. Then you need new textbooks. <laughs> your, your Highness, I may put an end to this argument at once by reminding you, my colleague and I base our arguments not on speculation or opinion, but on the divine Aristotle himself. Oh, uh, I've grown used to this. I am well used to it. Members of all faculties do the same thing. They close their minds and behave as if nothing were happening. I offer my observations, they smile. I put my telescope at their disposal, they quote Aristotle. But gentlemen, I do have to say to you, Aristotle had no telescope. He did not indeed. If Aristotle, who is recognized not just by the entire learning of antiquity, but also by Holy Rome itself, if Aristotle is to be dragged through the mud, then to me at least, this discussion becomes superfluous. I have no use for it enough. Truth is the child of time. It is not the prisoner of authority. Our ignorance of the world is infinite. Let us diminish it by at least one inch. Why try to be clever when offered a chance to be just a little less stupid? I've had the great good fortune to find an instrument which illuminates one tiny corner of the universe. Not much, but a little. For goodness sake, let us use it. Your Highness, gentlemen, what concerns me most is where this may lead. It's not for scientists to ask where the truth may lead. Sir Galilei, the truth may lead us to absolutely anything. Oh, Your Highness, I can only tell you already on nights such as these, all over Italy, men and women, all ages, all backgrounds, all sorts, are lifting these telescopes and looking. Now, tonight, this very evening, they are looking to the heavens and finding stars which have never been there. Now, from this, the man in the street concludes there may be more to things than he knows. You owe him that confirmation. It's not the stars themselves which have woken all Italy. It's the news that dogma is at last giving way. Gentlemen, let us not defend dying doctrines. You are teachers. You should rush to hasten their end. I would be grateful if your man did not intrude on scholarly debate. Your Highness, my work in the great arsenal of Venice brought me into daily touch with draftsmen, builders, artisans. They taught me a whole new way of looking at things. They don't read books, it's true. They do rely on their own five senses. It seems the only place where we may find that curiosity which was the true greatness of Greece is down in the docks. After what we've heard, it is not surprising me to learn that Sina Galilei is admired in the docks. Oh, oh, uh, Highness, I'm afraid this fascinating discussion has been a little prolonged. Uh, His Highness must rest before the royal ball. Signor Galilei. But, but, gentlemen, please, will you not look through the telescope? His Highness plans to consult our greatest living astronomer. He will submit your ideas to Father Christopher Clavius at the Papal College in Rome. Is that him? Is that Galileo? It is. Good evening. I'm glad my theories amuse you, churchmen, so much. I don't understand. What's happening? I cannot understand it. Why, Christopher Clavius, the church's greatest astronomer, why, he's even entertaining this stuff. And he's still in there? He's sitting there, peering through the devil's own tube. What does it say in the Bible? Sun, stars, 
Stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. It's written down. How can the sun stand still if it does not move at all, as these heretics say? Are the scriptures lying? No. There are things in astronomy, yes, which present us with difficulty. But does man have to understand everything? No. Why can't we just leave some things alone? I tell you, one day, these very same people will come and tell us man is not man. Uh, you wait. They will say that he is an animal. Nothing but animals next. <laughs> Signor Galilei, I think you may have dropped something. No, Signor. It fell up to me. Are they still in the Can they really lock up? We'll settle this more quickly. Carvius ought to understand his astronomy. I'm told this Galileo removes mankind from the center of the universe and dumps him down on the edge. Well, this alone makes him an enemy of humanity, and we must treat him as such. Mankind is, is the crown of creation. Yeah. How is it conceivable that God could take something so miraculously the fruit of such extraordinary genius and put him on a minor transient star? Not impossible. Would he send his son to such a place? No. How can there be people so stupid as to pin their faith on mathematics? <laughs> Which of God's creatures would do such a thing? The gentleman is in the room. Huh? Oh. So, uh, it's you, is it? You know, my eyesight is not what it was, but you seem to me to resemble that man we burnt not long ago. Your eminence must not excite you. You wish to downgrade the very earth you live on. It gives you everything, and yet you soil your own nest. How can you sit there? I will not be shamed by your existence. You cannot implicate me. I am not just an accidental creature briefly careering through space. I'm, I'm walking with a firm foot. There. It is at rest. It is on the earth. The earth is motionless. The earth is at the center of the universe. I am at the center. The creator eyes on me and me alone and round about me revolve attached to eight crystalline spheres the fixed stars and the sun the sun whose express purpose of existence is to shed light on where we live and on me so that God may see me in this way everything depends on me mankind God's greatest effort the and of all of all his works made, made in his structural your eminence has overstrained himself it's Carvius he is right no uh, uh, what, 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 what has happened? Uh, have they reached the decision? Uh, your eminence must be taken home. No, uh, but... Uh, 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 Signor Galilei! Signor Galilei! Before he left, Father Clavius said, Now let the theologians try to put our rings back in the sky again. <laughs> you have won! Not me, little monk. Reason. Reason has won. Signor Galileo. Good evening, Father. Who was that? Who did I just speak to? His Eminence, the Cardinal Inquisitor. I shall dance with no one but you, Ludovico. Your shoulder strap, please. <laughs> Fret not, daughter, if perchance you attract a wanton glance. <laughs> the eyes that catch a trembling lace will guess the heartbeat's quickened pace. Lovely women still may be careless with felicity. <laughs> Feel my heart. 
It's beating. I want to look beautiful. Well, it's essential. <laughs> People will start asking whether the Earth really does revolve. But it doesn't. <laughs> Signor, Rome talks of no one but you. But after tonight, it will be your daughter they speak of. Well, they say it's easy to look beautiful in the Roman spring. Even I must look like a slightly overweight Adonis. <laughs> Ah, um, I was to wait here for the Cardinal. Go on, you two. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Father. <laughs> oh, Rome. The first masked ball since the plague. All the greatest families are here. The Orsinis, the, the Villanis, the Nucolis, the Solvinieris. The Columbies! The Eminences, Cardinals, Bellamin and Barberini. The sun also riseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to his place where he arose. So says Ecclesiastes, and what says Galileo? Your Eminence, when I was this high, I stood on a ship and cried out, The shore is moving away. Today, I know it is the ship that moves and the shore which stands still. <laughs> <laughs> clever, clever. You produce explanations almost as clever as the problems you pose. But remember, for once you are speaking to a fellow scientist. Unfortunately, I too have read some astronomy. It sticks to one like a burr. <laughs> <laughs> Let us take off our masks, Barbaridi. We must move the times. If we can put Galileo's theories to practical use, if they help navigation, then we must not stand in their way. But what we cannot allow are teachings which contradict the Bible. The Bible. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him. Proverbs. Uh -huh. A prudent man concealeth knowledge. Proverbs. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. <laughs> he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh the city. Ah, but a, a, a broken spirit dryeth the house. Doth not the truth cry aloud? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? <laughs> Welcome to Rome, Galileo, my friend. You know the origins of the city. Two little boys received milk and shelter from a she-wolf. From that moment on, all her children have had to pay for their milk, but in return. The she-wolf provides every kind of pleasure. From conversation with my brilliant friend Bellamy in here, <laughs> to the friendship of at least three or four ladies of international repute. May I parade them before you? Uh, um, <laughs> no. Oh, he would rather have a serious discussion. Oh, very well. Are you sure, Signor, that you astronomers are not simply set on making astronomy simpler for yourself? Huh. I believe in reason. And I hold and reason to be inadequate. Huh? Huh. Silence. Now he is too polite to say that he holds me to be inadequate. <laughs> I believe uh, in reason. Th there is no need to take this down, scribes. This is a scientific conversation between friends. Reason, my friend, does not get us very far. All around we see nothing but suffering. The lives of our peasants are full of brutality and fear. Their lives are crueler than we can conceive. So we lend their sufferings dignity and meaning by ascribing intentions to a higher being. Our suffering, at least, becomes part of a plan. Now, this may not comfort us entirely, <laughs> but now you arrive and tell this higher being that he does not know how the stars move a matter on which you claim to know more than him is that wise i am a true son of the church oh, this man is incorrigible he <laughs> seeks to prove god's incompetence was god not competent to write the bible does it not seem likely to you that god knows more about his handiwork than the handiwork knows about itself <laughs> but ge gentlemen if man misinterprets the universe maybe he misinterprets the bible too but the interpretation of the bible is in the end a matter for theologians of the holy church is it not <laughs> <laughs> he is silent. At last! He is silent. Scribes, you will take this down. Yes, sir. Signor Galilei, 
Tonight the Holy Office has decided that the teachings of Copernicus, according to which the sun is the center of the universe and does not move, while the earth is not the center of the universe and moves, are futile and foolish, and they are heresy. It is my duty to tell you to abandon this belief. Uh, what does this mean? Shh, shh, shh. Uh, this. But the facts! The Collegium Romanum confirmed my observations. They did, and with a satisfaction which does you great honor. But the planets around Jupiter, the phases of Venus. The Holy Office did not consider these things. In other words, all future research There is, is no problem. The church is saying we can never know. But if we wish, we are free to try and find out. <laughs> you are free to expound your teaching, but as mathematical hypothesis, not as a truth. Oh. Science, Signor Galileo, is the legitimate and well-loved daughter of the church. And no one here seriously believes you wish to undermine the authority of the church. His authority is own abuses that undermine it. Do they? Don't throw the child away with the water. It's in nobody's interest for you to do that. We will not do that. We need you more than you need us. I am burning to present you to the president of the Holy Office. <laughs> he admires you so much. You would have done well to adopt a disguise tonight, Signor Galilei. Perhaps the disguise of a humble and orthodox scholar. <laughs> disguise has its uses. Behind my mask, you may perhaps hear me say, if there were no God, we would have to invent him. Good. Masks on again. If only you had one. <laughs> Did you get that last sentence? I did. Have you got the bit where he says he believes in reason? Did the conversation take place? Your Eminence. Uh, Signor Galileo arrived with his daughter. Today she was yes, engaged. Yes, yes, the transcript. Just wait, Ludovico. <laughs> well, my daughter. Oh, Your Eminence. A wonderful evening. Hmm? Permit me to congratulate you on your engagement. The groom comes from a noble family. Will you remain with us in Rome? Not immediately, Your Eminence. There is so much to do before a wedding. Uh, so you will go back to Florence with your father, hmm? Good. I'm pleased. Your father needs you. Mathematics is a cold companion, I think. He needs flesh and blood beside him. A great man can lose himself all too easily in the vast world of the stars. You are most kind, Your Eminence. Oh. For myself, I understand nothing of these things. No. No one eats fish in a fisherman's house. <laughs> Your father will be amused when he hears you at last learned some astronomy from the Cardinal Inquisitor. You learned some astronomy from me. I read here that our innovators, of whom your father is the acknowledged leader, now believe that the importance of the Earth has been greatly exaggerated. We have always believed the universe was 20,000 times the Earth's size. Roomy enough, you would think, but no, no, not for our friends. Now they are saying it is almost infinite. <laughs> the distance between us and the Sun is as nothing compared to the distances beyond. Now, who can say our scientists do not live on a grand scale? <laughs> Oh, true, some gentlemen of the Holy Office are rather disturbed by this new view of the universe. The world as described in the scriptures has suddenly become little more than a bauble one might hang round the neck of certain young ladies. <laughs> in the vastness of this new universe, a priest or even a cardinal may easily get lost. The Almighty might even overlook the Pope himself. <laughs> yes, it is amusing. And it is also consoling that you will remain so close to your father, whom we all esteem so much. Do I know your 
confessor? Father Christophus of St. Ursula. Yes. I am glad you will be with your father. He will need you. Or oh, perhaps you cannot imagine it, but I must tell you, the time will come. He will need you. Oh, but I'm keeping you. I'll make your fiancé jealous. <laughs> Maybe your father too, by telling you things about the stars, which he will think horribly out of date. Uh, dance, go, go dance. Dance the whole evening. Uh, but remember me also to Father Christophus. Your eminence. Go ahead, little monk. Speak. Say anything. The clothes you're wearing give you the right. I have studied mathematics, Signor Galilei. That'll come in handy. For three nights now, I have not slept at all. I, I could not make sense of anything. I have seen the planets of Jupiter. I have seen them with my own eyes, but I have also read the church's decree. This morning I said mass early and decided then I will come straight here to you. What, to tell me Jupiter has no planets? No, to tell you that I now see the wisdom in the church's actions. We are in danger, I'm sure. Unrestricted research is a danger to humanity. No! Yes, I do mean it. I have decided to give astronomy up. I want to tell you my reasons. You hardly need to. I think we can guess what they are. I understand your bitterness. The church has exceptional powers of enforcement, I know. So we just call them instruments of torture? But that is not why I am going to give up. Let me tell you. I grew up in the Campania. My parents were peasants. Now, as I study the movements of Venus, I somehow I, I can't help seeing my parents as well. Among the olive trees, sitting huddled round a fire with my sister, eating their olives and cheese. I see the blackened rafters of that cottage. I see the veins on the backs of their hands. Yes, they are poor, but in their poverty there is a certain order. There is a sense of the rightness of things. Every day they gather up their strength to sweat up the stony paths with their baskets. They find the strength to bear children. Yes even to eat from the feeling of ritual, of continuity, which comes from the very feel of the soil, from the trees also and from their seasons, from the small church which has always been there, and also, yes, from each Sunday's readings, from the Bible itself. Each Sunday's Bible, which is always different and yet always the same. They have always been told that God is watching them, the world has been built so that each human being may act out their part. Now, what would they say, my parents, if I were to tell them that they are really on a small piece of rock which ceaselessly revolves an empty space round a star which in itself is of no special importance? What then is the value of all their patience, their endurance, their valour? What is it for? What use now is the Bible, which has explained and justified their suffering, their hunger, and given it shape? What if now I go to them, I, I take them aside, I, I sit them down and I tell them, everything you have hitherto believed is an error. Do you really believe that is a kind thing to do? Galileo, I see them frightened. I see their eyes wavering. I see them lost and betrayed. Oh, so no one is watching us. Uh, that's what they'll say. We're here. There is no role for us. We must look after ourselves, worn out as we are. Our suffering is without purpose. Hunger is nothing more than having no food. Work is simply the time you spend doing it. Work is nothing more than the actions performed. And at the end, there is nothing. It has no meaning at all. 
So now do you see in that decree of the Holy Congregation, I, I find a great compassion, Galileo. I find a vast goodness of soul. Goodness of soul. Mm. What you describe, the conditions you speak of, the suffering you see in their lives, do you think it's God-given? Hmm? Do you think it's predestined? I mean, do, do you really think it's the way things have to be? Oh, yes, you're right. In one thing, you're quite right. I grant you that. The issue here is not the movement of the heavens. It's not the planets. No one cares about the transit of the stars. What matters here are the peasants of the Campania. This is a struggle for the soul of the people themselves. This land is rich. Oh, yes. I travel through Italy, yes. I see order, oh, yes, indeed. I see the order which you so lovingly describe. And what is that order? It's the order of the empty larder. Not so. These people are thirsting. Their lips are parched. Their throats are burning. They cry out for wine. And they're told to go suck on a cassock. Why is it so important that the earth be at the center of the universe, huh? There's only one reason it should matter at all. So that St. Peter may, in his turn, be at the center of the world, which is at the center of the universe. That is the church's true and only purpose. They need to go on fighting their wars. Yes, even now the friends of gentle Jesus have armies in Spain, in Germany, fighting today. And who pays? Who starves? Huh? Who finances the fight? Well, of course, these virtuous peasants of yours. Well, I reject their virtue. Endurance, valor, forbearance, these qualities which move you so much. Tell me, do you really think virtue must be the fruit of poverty? Can there not be virtue in happiness and prosperity too? The new pumps I shall make will bring the people miracles, miracles worth far more than the ridiculous servitude they're made to suffer now. Yet you come here today and you tell me, in the interest of maintaining their suffering, you tell me, you order me, I must go on telling your own parents lies. That's not what I said. Oh, is it not? It's a matter of principle. Principle? How? People must be allowed peace. Oh. They must. We must not unhinge them. Who are we? What right have we? We come and remove the comforts of faith. This morning, I tell you first thing this morning, Cardinal Bellarmine's coachman passed by. He gave me a present. He gave me a clock by Cellini. Do you think I don't know the reason? Do you think I don't see why I've earned my reward? What is my virtue, eh? Well, I've not disturbed these peasants of yours. Oh, yes, a bribe. They offer me wine which is wrung from the sweat of your parents' brows. They offer me an easy life, freedom from persecution. But if they were thereby to buy my silence, if I were to give the peasants this peace you describe, I do not deceive myself it would be from any kind of principle. Signor Galilei, I am a priest. You are also a physicist. And you can see that Venus has phases. We see it. It is plainly the truth. He who does not know the truth is an idiot. There's no virtue in ignorance. None. But he who knows the truth and chooses to deny it, he is something much worse. I tell you, he is a criminal too. Look, see, over there in the garden, I was looking before you arrived. Statue of Priapus. God of gardens. God of birds. God of thieves. Look at him. Rustic, obscene, 2,000 years old. All right, I'll admit, I'm a true son of the church, but I look at that little figure, a figure of mischief, and I think to myself, yeah, well, at least he told fewer lies. I was reading Horace, he's my favorite, self-balanced, I think. In the eighth satire, as he has a Priapus statue actually speak. A fig tree log. A useless piece of wood was I. 
when the carpenter, uncertain whether to carve a priapus or a stool, decided on the god. You see, it's as much to do with beauty as anything else. Well, can you imagine if someone had gone to Horace and said, sorry, that word must be changed, can't be stool, it must be, oh, I don't know, it must be, any, it must be anything, I don't, it must be table instead. Well, can, can you imagine? You see, for me, it's no different. My sense of beauty is wounded if Venus appears in my universe without its phases. It's the same thing. In my heart, I see Galileo. I hear it. I know it's the truth. But can't the truth prosper without us? Can't the truth find its own way? Oh, you speak, but you already know the answer. Truth will conquer only if we do. Reason's victory depends purely upon human beings who are willing to employ it. It falls to us and we have no choice. You talk about your parents and their families. You talk about the peasants who make their lives on the hills. Yet in the very concern you exhibit for them, you treat them as if they were nothing, inert, unthinking, as if they were the mindless moss on their own huts. It's they who must change. We will give them inventions, but these inventions will bring them no benefit at all unless the change is in them. Oh, God help us all. I see the divine patience of the people, but where is their anger? They are tired. Ugh. Are you a physicist, my boy? Here. Here you'll find the reasons why the ocean moves, why it ebbs, why it flows. Ah, but of course you mustn't read it. Oh, you've already started. Well, perhaps you are a physicist after all. An apple from the tree of knowledge. And he's wolfing it down. He knows he's damned forever, but that won't stop him finishing his meal. I sometimes feel I'd be willing to live in a dungeon 200 feet down in absolute darkness if it meant I would then know what light really is. And then I'd have to tell someone as a lover, like a drunkard, like a traitor. I know it's a sin. I know it leads to disaster. But how long can I shout in the void? Uh, this bit, I, I, I don't get this bit. Here, let me help. At last! <laughs> this is for the long dining table. Ludovico loves entertaining. <laughs> Everything for the wedding has to be perfect. His mother notices every loose thread. <laughs> she doesn't approve of father's books. Neither does my confessor, Father Christophe. Oh, your father's not written a book for years. <laughs> no, I think he knows he was wrong. Once in Rome, a very senior cardinal explained astronomy to me. The distances are too great. Mm. Thursday afternoon. Floating bodies. Ice, again. A bucket with water, scales, an iron needle, Aristotle. Oh, we've waited so long for this, Virginia. Well, you've waited eight years to marry your Ludovico, but you're still young. Mm. Yeah, and somebody needs to talk to you. I'm concerned with the future and how it will turn out. I'm not educated, I know nothing, but I do know not to go into things blind. You need a proper astronomer to do you a good horoscope so you know where you are. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I've already been. Oh, and so? For the first three months, I need to be especially careful because the sun will be in Capricorn. Ooh. But then I'll get a favourable ascendant mm -hmm. and the clouds will part. That's when I can go on a long journey because I'm a Capricorn. Oh, and Ludovico, he's a Leo. <gasps> His nature is sensual. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Um, the rector of the university called earlier. He asked me not to disturb. He left this book. What's it about? Well, I don't know. It's in Latin. De maculis and sole. Sunspots, another one. 
I've read the Sunspot Treatise by Fabrizius of Holland. He believes they're swarms of stars passing between the Earth and the Sun. Oh, I'm not sure, Andrea. What do you think, Signor Galileo? In Paris and Prague, they are convinced they're vapours from the Sun. Mm. <laughs> but it's only doubts that. No, no, don't drag me into it. Oh, I said, oh, that's all. I'm a lens grinder. I grind lenses. <laughs> and when you look through them, what you see are not spots. They're called macula, didn't you know? Well, how could I have an opinion about anything? The books are in Latin, so I know nothing at all. <laughs> There's happiness in doubt. I wonder why. Every day now for two weeks, whenever the sun shines, I've climbed into the attic under the roof. A thin ray of light comes through a crack in the shingles. Now, on a sheet of paper, you get an inverted image of the sun. I've seen a spot as big as a fly and smudged like a cloud. It was moving. Now, why aren't we looking into these spots? Because we're working on floating bodies. Our cupboards are stuffed with letters from all over Europe, asking to know what you think. Well, your reputation is so great, you cannot stay silent. Rome allows my reputation to grow because I stay silent. You cannot oh. afford to be silent anymore. I cannot afford to be barbecued like a ham. Do you think the sunspots are part of that other business? All right, then, let's stick to the ice. It can't hurt you. Correct. Our thesis, Andrea. On the question of floating. It is our belief that it is not the shape of the body which matters, but whether it is lighter or heavier than water. Mm. And let us hear what Aristotle says. Uh, discus latus oh, platy. Oh, right. Translate, uh, translate. A broad and flat disc of ice is able to float on the water, whereas an iron needle sinks. And what is his view on why ice doesn't sink? Uh, because of its shape. It is broad and flat and therefore cannot divide the water. Good. I am pressing the ice down with my hands, I remove the pressure, and what happens? It rises to the surface again. Right. So apparently it can divide the water when it rises. Uh, but then why does it float in the first place? Uh, it's heavier than water because it's condensed. But what if it were thin? It must be lighter than water, otherwise it wouldn't float. Aha. Uh -huh. Just as an iron needle won't float. Everything that's lighter than water floats, everything that's heavier sinks. Andrea, you must learn to think more carefully. Hmm? Now, give me a needle and some paper. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, is iron heavier than water? Yes. Right. I lay the needle on a sheet of paper and gently slide it onto the surface of the water. And what's happening? The needle is floating! Yes. <laughs> oh, that's sacred Aristotle! They never put him to the test! <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the principal reasons for failure in science is imagining we've had a success. Our aim is not to open the door to wisdom, but rather to set a limit on our own stupidity. Now, write up your notes. Oh, oh dear. What's wrong? Every time they laugh, it frightens me. I ask myself, what are they laughing at? Father says, theologians have their bell ringing and the physicists have their laughter. Well, I'm glad he no longer uses that telescope. Now all he does is put ice in water. Well, There's no harm in that. Well, I'm not so sure. Virginia! Oh! Ludovico! Why didn't you write? I had no idea you were coming! <laughs> I was in the region visiting our vineyards. I couldn't resist coming by. <laughs> Who's this? Ludovico! Can't you see him? Oh, yes, Ludovico. How are the horses? Oh, uh, they're splendid, thank you, Signor. Signor Sarti, please, there's celebration. Fetch the Sicilian wine, our old stuff, the best. Oh, yes, Signor. You're looking pale, Virginia. Life in the country will suit you. My mother's expecting you in September. Wait, let me show you my wedding dress. Oh. Why don't you sit down? I hear you have 1,000 students at your lectures. What are you working at now? Oh, the usual, you know. Did you come through Rome? Yes. Oh, before I forget, my mother wanted to say she admired the tact you have shown. I mean, towards the Dutch and their recent sunspot orgies. Tell her, please, that's very kind. Rome is already aflame with gossip. Father Clavius has said that the sunspot research will mean that all that earth round the sun nonsense will start up again. It won't. And what other gossip? You know, of course, the Holy Father is dying. What? Who do they think will succeed? The favourite is Barberini. Barberini? Signor Galileo knows Barberini. Barberini is a mathematician. A scientist on the papal throne. Oh, 
Well, maybe things are moving. <laughs> Even the church now needs men like Barberini, men who know a little mass. Things are moving at last. We may yet see the day for us only when we won't have to act like criminals when we assert that two and two are four. <laughs> 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 I like this wine, Ludovico. <clears throat> what do you think of it? Oh, um, it's good. I know the vineyard it comes from. The hillside is stony and steep. The grapes are almost blue. Ooh, I love this wine. Yes, indeed. Mm. Oh, it's almost sweet, but not quite. <laughs> Andrea, clear all that junk away. The ice, the bucket, all that stuff. Oh, I do so love the pleasures of the flesh, don't you? I've no patience for those who call them weaknesses. Pleasures like anything else, it must be achieved. Uh, what have you in mind? <laughs> oh, to start all that earth round the sun nonsense again. <laughs> Perhaps we'll discover the sun goes round too. How would that suit you, Marcelli? <laughs> why the excitement? Oh, you're not going to start that devil's work up again. Now I understand why your mother sent you here. Barberini ascends to the papal throne. Knowledge will at last be a passion. Research will be a delight. Clavius is right. Those sunspots do interest me. Do you like my wine, Ludovico? <laughs> I've already said so. Now, do you really like it? Yes. I like your wine. So, please don't ask when you're already taking from me my wine and my daughter to take my work from me as well. What's astronomy got to do with Virginia? The movements of Venus will not affect the shape of her backside. Oh, don't be so crude. I am going to fetch Virginia. No. In families like mine, we do not marry solely for pleasure. Did they tell you not to marry my daughter? Have I been on probation these past eight years? The woman who marries me will have to sit beside me. She will take her place in our pew in the church. And what? You think if she's not known to be godly, the peasants will stop paying their rent? Since you say it, yes. <sighs> Fetch the brass reflector. We'll throw the image onto the screen to protect our eyes. Your technique, Andrea. In Rome, remember? You signed an undertaking. Oh, then, well, then we had a reactionary pope. He isn't dead yet. As good as. Oh, put a squared grid over the screen. We will proceed methodically. And then Andrea will be able to answer all these letters. As good as, as good as you're saying. Scientific accuracy, that's your whole life. But when something's going on which happens to appeal to you, then suddenly accuracy counts for nothing at all. Oh, Signor Galileo, now I'll tell you something. I have seen my son fall into sin with all these experiments sin. and theories and observations and I could do nothing. You set yourself up against the authorities. They warned you once. The greatest men of the church have indulged you like a sick child and he worked for a time. But two months ago, just after the Annunciation, I caught you back at it in the attic. I didn't say anything, but I did run and light a candle to St. Joseph because the whole thing is like a disease. If I lose my chance of eternal salvation because I've spent my life with a heretic, well, all right, that's my choice. But you have no right to trample on the happiness of your own daughter. Get me the telescope. Oh. I'm putting my luggage back in the coach. Well, she'll never get over it. You can tell her I won't. I can see your mind is made up. Signor Galilei, my mother and I spend three quarters of our year on our estates on the Campania. It will come, no doubt, as bad news to you, but our peasants are not remotely concerned for the satellites of Jupiter. Why? Because they're working too hard. But what would disturb them is if they heard that frivolous attacks on the church go unpunished. Please don't ever forget these people are not clever. They live like animals and are just as stupid. And they hear a rumour that an apple tree has been producing pears, then they stop work and run to gossip about it. Do they? Animals. When they come to the house with all their trivial complainings, my mother is forced to have a dog whipped in front of their eyes. It's the only way to impress on them exactly what civilization and order may be. You, Signor, like any intellectual, you eat your cheese or your olives without thinking. You ride as you wish, and from your coach you look out over the fields. But you have no sense of the reality, of the need for discipline. You know nothing of all our hard work. Young man, 
I never eat olives without thinking. You're wasting my time. Have you got the screen? Yes. Are you ready? It's not just dogs you whip to keep in order, eh, Masley? You have a fine mind. It's a shame. Are you threatening him? Oh, yes. He understands the danger. I might stir his peasants into thinking new thoughts, and his servants, and his staff. Oh! None of them reads Latin. No, but I might write in the language of the people, for the new ideas need the people who work with their hands. Who else cares? Who else is interested? Those who just find their bread on the table have no interest in how it was baked. They'd rather thank God than thank the baker. But those who make the bread, yet those are my people, because they have real experience. They know the true nature of things. Yet like a girl who spends a day at the olive press, I think she'll laugh when she hears the news. The sun is not a golden badge. It's just a lever. The earth moves because the sun sets it moving. You will always be a slave to your obsessions. Say goodbye to Virginia. It's better I don't see her. Her diary will always be waiting for you. <laughs> Good day. And best regards to the Marsilies. The Gigi. Uh, the Villanese. Oh, the Pierleoni. The great families of Italy all fall and kiss the feet of the Pope so that the Pope, thus anointed, may direct his foot straight into Italy's groin. <laughs> uh, the new Pope will be better. He is enlightened. So, now we begin the great examination of these spots on the sun. We begin fully knowing the dangers <laughs> and putting not too much trust in the Pope. But also supremely confident of overturning all other theories and of establishing the movement of the sun. Confident, yes, but not supremely. The purpose of the exercise is not to prove that I've been right, but to find out whether I've been right. I say abandon hope anyone who embarks on an experiment. These things may be sunspots. They may just be clouds. But the best place to start scientifically is by assuming that they're actually fried fish. <laughs> we will question everything, perpetually, slowly. And what we find today, tomorrow we shall begin to throw out and only restore it when we once more discover it. And when we find something which pleases us especially, then we shall regard it with a special distrust. So. We shall start this particular experiment with the express intention of proving that the Earth stands still. And only when we are defeated, when we are beaten and licking our wounds, only then, in despair, in utmost dejection, shall we allow ourselves the question, perhaps we were right all along, perhaps the Earth really does go round the sun. But once we've arrived at our conclusion, there will be no mercy for those who have not looked and yet who think themselves entitled to speak. Take the cloth of the telescope and turn it to the sun. Father, you send him away! As the star attraction of this year's carnival, I'm happy to present to you a Punch and Judy show. Yay! The confrontation you've all been waiting for. Here in front of your very eyes, we will dramatise the new age. Stage here tonight, in the middle of the world, in the middle of the galaxy, in the middle of the infinitely strange universe itself, a confrontation between two mighty figures. Starring on my left, Italy's most famous astronomer, Galileo Galilei Bible Basher. And on my right, I'm afraid to say, yes, and in person himself, the forces of reaction, as embodied by your very own Pope Urban VIII. <laughs> Out of the ring, seconds away, and let battle come in. <laughs> 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 It's taken.
taking forever. Yes. I think that man who was watching us all the time followed us here. Well, I don't know him. I've seen him several times in the last few days. He makes me jumpy. Oh, nonsense. We're in Florence, not a Corsican hillside. Here comes the rector of the university. Oh, no, he does frighten me. I want to gossip for hours. Single. Let's, let's get into him. Oh, not my eyes are bad again. Did, did he greet us at all? Hardly. What's in your book? Do you think they will judge it heretical? You, you hang around in churches too much. <sighs> Getting up so early and going to mass is ruining your looks. You say prayers for me, don't you? This is Signor Varney, the iron founder you designed your furnace for. Don't forget to thank him for the quails. Did you like the quails I sent you, Signor Galilei? The quails were delicious. I must thank you again. They're all talking about you up there. They hold you responsible for these pamphlets attacking the Bible, which are on every street corner these days. I know nothing about pamphlets. The Bible and Homer are what I read. There's no need to be so cautious with me, Signor. I'm on your side. My side? What side's that? I speak for all manufacturers, all industrialists, the whole new rising class of people who are desperate to see this country move on. I'm afraid to ask. The stars mean less than nothing. But you are the man who is fighting for the right to teach what is new. Am I? Well, of course. Europe is changing. In Amsterdam and London, there are business schools, money markets, and papers with news printed on them which appear every day. Yet in Italy, we are still not given the freedom to make money. We cannot employ your invention. We are told iron foundries are a bad thing because too many people in one place encourages immorality. <laughs> yeah, that's the scale of our problems. <laughs> Senor, I sink or swim with people like you. Indeed. Remember, if they try to move against you, the world of commerce will stand alongside you. The cities of northern Italy are yours. So far as I know, no one means to move against me. Don't they? No. In my view, you'd be better off in Venice. Far fewer priests. From there, you could fight. I have a travelling coach and horses outside. No, I, I don't see myself in exile. I like my comforts too much. Yes. Perhaps you understand what I'm saying. Look, I've been upstairs. It's a matter of urgency. They would prefer you not to be in Florence. Oh, nonsense. The Grand Duke has been my pupil, and the Pope himself would never countenance any kind of a trap. I'm not sure your gift is for distinguishing your friends from your enemies, Signor Galilei. I can distinguish power from impotence. Very well. I wish you luck. Be fool with a grievance wants me to be their spokesman, especially in places where it won't do me any good. I've written a book about the mechanics of the universe. What people make of that is none of my concern. If only they knew how you condemn what happened everywhere last carnival. Yes. Did the Grand Duke actually send for you? No. I had myself announced. He wants the book. He has paid for it. Ask that guard why we've been waiting so long. Signor Minchu, has the Grand Duke been informed that my father is waiting to speak to him? How would I know? That is no answer. Isn't it? It is actually part of your job to be polite. He says the Grand Duke is busy. I heard you say polite. What was that? I thanked him for his reply. That was all. Can't you just leave your book here? We are wasting our time. Well, I'm not sure what my time's worth nowadays. The Cardinal Inquisitor. <sighs> Signor Galilei. Your eminence. Why is the Cardinal Inquisitor in Florence, Father? I don't know. But he did acknowledge me, didn't he? I knew what I was doing when I came to Florence and kept quiet for so long. They've built me up so high they can't disown me now. His Highness the Grand Duke. Ah. Uh, your Highness, um, I, I wanted to show your Highness my dialogues on the two world systems. Uh, yes, uh, how are your eyes? Uh, uh, well, not, not, not good, Your Highness. Uh, if Your Highness will permit, I have the book here. Your eyes worry me. They worry me profoundly. 
Could it be that you spent uh, too much time with your tube? Take the book, eh? Father, I'm frightened. Don't let it show. From here, we will not go home. We'll go to Cutters. I have an arrangement with him. In the tavern yard next door to him, there is always a wagon with empty wine casks waiting to take me away. You knew! Don't look around. Signor Galilei, it is my duty to inform you that the Florentine court feels itself unable any longer to refuse the request of the Holy Inquisition to examine you in Rome. The coach of the Holy Inquisition is waiting, Signor Galilei. No, no, no. So, I see. We have here an assembly of doctors of all faculties, representatives of every part of the church, who have arrived with their childlike belief in God's word, and from you, your holiness, they will receive not confirmation, not what they have come for. Are you truly proposing to tell them the holy scriptures may no longer be regarded as true? I will not have his mathematical tables destroyed. No. Oh, do you really believe this dispute is about mathematics? Mm. Of course, that's what they would like us to think. But does anyone question the true subject? It is the spirit of denial and of doubt. In these people's minds, there is a terrible restlessness, and they project their own restlessness onto the physical world. They cry, we have no choice. Just look at the figures. Ah, but where do the figures come from? They are bred in the hothouse of their own doubt. These men doubt everything regardless. Can we build a whole society on doubt? Hmm? You are my master, but I doubt if you should be. Yes, that is your house and your wife, but better if you gave them to me. And abroad. We all know your own foreign policy is misrepresented. The Reformation tears everything apart. Christianity is becoming a victim of factions. It's riven with divisions and splits. And at this time, of course, just at this very moment when the church is threatened by war and by plague, these worms, these mathematicians, turn their goggle glasses to the skies and tell your holiness that here, in the one domain where no one hitherto has ever dared to contest you, suddenly they say, you are ill-informed. And do you think this is chance? <laughs> this sudden interest in astronomy, a subject which for years was of no importance at all. I mean, does anyone care? Is anyone interested? Does it matter at all how planets move? And yet now, there's no one in Italy, no stable boy, no schoolchild, too stupid or low to express the opinion that what has been accepted as authority is apparently now to be overturned. I ask you, please, now, I just, I just ask you, to imagine a world in which simple people were to trust only their own rational processes. If their own feeble reasoning would be their only court of appeal. Even as a young man, Galileo wrote about machinery. With machinery, miracles would happen, he said, and of course, without God, what is the only miracle that interests them? Why, making men equal, of course. Suddenly, they're quoting from Aristotle, who on all other matters they regard with contempt. When the weaver's loom weaves by itself and the plectrum plays the guitar, then masters will need no apprentices and lords no servants. And they're saying that that state is already here. This, this, this evil man knows what he's doing when he writes his astronomical works, not in Latin, but in the language of fishwives and merchants. Oh, yes, yes. Certainly that is very bad taste. I shall mention he it He incites him. the one lot, he bribes the other. The ports of northern Italy clamour for his star charts. We'll have to give way. Commercial interests are at risk. But the star charts are based on his heretical teachings. Without his teachings, they do not make sense. We can hardly allow the star charts and disallow the teachings. We can do nothing else. Oh, these shuffling feet. They make me nervous. Oh, forgive me. I hear them all the time. Yes. Well, perhaps they speak more to you than I can. Are these people all to leave here with doubt in their hearts? This man is not an idiot. He is not a crank. He is the great physicist of the age. The glory of Italy. 
He has friends. There is Versailles. There is the court of Vienna. Mm. They'll call the Holy Church a cesspool of decaying prejudice. I have to adjure you. Leave him alone. In practice, one would not have to go far with him. He is a man of the flesh. He'd give in at once. Yes, he certainly understands pleasure better than any man I've met. He thinks from pleasure. He cannot resist an old wine or a new idea. But I will not allow anything which has us denying reality. I'm not having battles. The church against reason. No one would profit from that. I let him write his book on condition that it ended with him giving the last word to faith. Now, he did that. He met that condition. Ah, but in what way? In the book, a stupid man represents Aristotle. He argues with a clever man who represents Galileo. And who has the last word? Who? Not the clever man. All right. No, the stupid man. All right. Yes, that was impertinent. Oh, this shuffling in corridors cannot be borne. Is the whole world coming here? Not the whole world. Just mm. all that is good in it. Oh. The very most you may do is to show him the instruments. <sighs> that will suffice, Your Holiness. Signor Galilei is an expert on instruments. The Pope wouldn't see him. No more discussions about science. And that was his last hope. It's true, you know, what Barberini said years ago in Rome at the ball that night when he was still a cardinal. He said, we need you. Well, now they have him. They will destroy him. The discourse will never be finished. You think so? Of course, because he will never recant. Mm -hmm. Stupid thoughts come to you when you're lying awake every night, huh? Last night I kept thinking... He should never have left Venice. He could not write his book there. Then in Florence, he couldn't publish it. And also, that, that little stone, the stone he always carries in his pocket. Do you think, do you think they let him keep it? His touchstone. Where he's going, no one has pockets at all. But they won't dare, they won't. They won't do it. And even if they do, he will never recant. He who does not know the truth is an idiot. But he who knows it and chooses to deny it, he is a criminal. That's what he said. I don't think he will either. If he does, I don't want to live. But they have force. Well, force can't do everything. Well, perhaps not. That time I came here to see him, just two days after the decree, we sat over there and, and he pointed, look there, to the little figure of Priapus by the sundial in the garden. I, he compared his work to a poem by Horace in which nothing can be changed. A fig tree log, a useless piece of wood, was I, when the carpenter, uncertain whether to carve a priapus or a stool, decided on the god. He said, you cannot separate beauty from truth. <laughs> Have you told him how he stood in the Collegium Romanum when they were examining his telescope? No. <laughs> well, he behaved as if there were nothing unusual. His hands, as always, on his behind. He stuck out his stomach and said, I ask only for reason, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> she is praying he will recant. Believe her. She's almost mad since they spoke to her. You know, they brought her father confessor from Florence. <laughs> Signor Galilei will be here soon. He may need a bed. Has he been freed? Signor Galilei is expected to recant at five o'clock before a session of the Inquisition. Merciful heaven! The great bell of St. Mark's will be rung. The recantation will be read out in public. <laughs> I don't believe it. Because of the size of the crowds, Signor Galilei will be brought through the garden. The moon is on earth and has no light of its own. 
Nor does Venus have its own light. Like the Earth, it revolves round the Sun. And four moons revolve round the planet Jupiter, which is in the region of the fixed stars and is not attached to any crystal sphere. And the Sun is the centre of the universe. It is motionless in space. And the Earth is not the centre and is not motionless. And he is the one who showed it to us. And no force exists on Earth which can make men unsee what has been seen. Look at the sundial. It's five o'clock. I can't wait any longer. They're killing the truth! Nothing. And it's well past five. Well, he's resisting. Mm. He is not recanting. No. Oh, 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 brother. <laughs> brothers. Oh, our force has not prevailed. Two force cannot do everything. Stupidity is conquered. It does not triumph everywhere. Man is not afraid of death. And now the age of science has truly begun. It's born at this moment. Oh, think if we had recanted. Oh. I, I did not say it, but I was scared. I had so little faith. But I knew. It would have been as if night had fallen as the sun rose. Uh, as if a mountain had said, I am the sea. Oh, Lord, I thank you. Oh, but today everything is changed. Tortured man lifts up his head and says, now I can live. So much is won when just one man stands up and says no. The bell of St. Mark's is not dead. I, Galileo Galilei, teacher of mathematics and physics at the University of Florence, renounce what I have taught, that the sun is center of the universe and motionless in its place and that the earth is not the center and is not motionless. I recant, or swear, and execrate with all my heart and faith all these falsehoods and heresies, as well as every other falsehood or opinion which is contrary to the teachings of the Holy Church. paid you properly for your work. You couldn't afford a pair of trousers, let alone publish your own work. It was all fine because we were working for science. Unhappy the land that has no heroes. <laughs> I cannot look at him. Get him out of here. Calm down. Piss artist. Snail. Have you saved your precious skin? I feel sick. Get him some water. I, Galileo Galilei, teacher of mathematics and physics at the University of Florence, I, I can walk I now. If you give me your arm. No! Unhappy the land that needs heroes! As well as every other falsehood or opinion which is contrary to the teachings of the Holy Church. I who have seen the summer roses Passing through. 
Someone passing through has left us a present. Mm, what is it? Can't you see? Oh, geese. Is there a name on them? No. Mm, heavy. I could manage some of that now. Well, you can't honestly be hungry. You've just had your supper. And your eyes are bad again. You should have seen they were geese. Were you in the shadow? I'm not in the shadow. You cook them with apples and thyme. We must send for the eye doctor. Father couldn't see the geese. I can't do that without Monsignor Capola's permission. Has he been writing alone? No, you know he dictates everything to me. You've got pages 131 and 132. There's nothing since then. Mm, he's an old fox. He sticks to the rules. His contrition is genuine. I watch him. Tell them in the kitchen to roast the livers with an apple and onion. Mm. And now shall we give your eyes a little rest? Let's leave that ball, shall we? And we'll get on with our weekly letter to the Archbishop. I'm not up to it. Please read me some horrors. Monsignor Carpola, to whom we owe everything. Uh, More fresh vegetables again the other day is forever telling me how much it means to the Archbishop that you answer yeah. his questions and sayings from mm. the Bible every week. Mm. Yeah. Oh, where, where, where was I? Paragraph 4. Concerning the attitude of the Holy Church to the riots in the Grand Arsenal of Venice. I agree with Cardinal Spalletti about the rebellious rope makers. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I agree entirely with Cardinal Spalletti. In the name of Christian love and brotherhood, it is better to give the demonstrators soup than to give them more money for their work making ropes for the church for surely it must be wiser to feed their faith than to feed their greed. As the Apostle Paul says, charity never fails. How does that sound? Very moving, Father. Mm. You don't think there's a danger of irony? No, the Archbishop will be thrilled. He's so practical. <sighs> well, I, I rely on your judgment. Next. A beautiful saying. If I am weak, I am strong. No comment. Why not? N next. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Ephesians 3.19. Yeah, I, I would particularly like to thank your eminence for the wonderful text from the epistle to the Ephesians. Oh, who's this? Uh, good evening. I'm leaving Italy to work in Holland. I was asked to look him up so I can bring people news of him. I don't know if he'll see you. It's been a long time. Ask him. Is it Andrea? Yes. Shall I send him away? Bring him in. Uh, just a moment. He was once his pupil, so now he's his enemy. Uh, leave us alone, Virginia. I want to hear what he has to say. How are you? I, no, no, come closer. What are you up to these days? I, I, they tell me you're working on uh, hydraulics. Fabrizius in Amsterdam wanted me to ask after your health. Well, my health is good. They look after me. I shall be happy to report you are well. Oh, well, Fabricius will be pleased to hear it. And you may also tell him I live comfortably here. The depth of my repentance has meant my superiors even allow me a little scientific work, within certain boundaries, of course, and under the strict supervision of the church. Yes, we knew the church was pleased with you. Your capitulation has had its effect. It has ensured that in Italy no new ideas have been published since you submitted. Yes, but you know, I, I fear there are countries which refuse the protection of the church. I fear new teachings are disseminated there. No. Abroad as well. There is reaction everywhere thanks to your recantation. Oh, really? What, nothing from Descartes? Nothing from Paris? Yes. When he heard you had recanted, he stuffed his treatise on the nature of light in a drawer. Uh, oh... I'm anxious for certain scientific colleagues who I may have led into sin. Have they been redeemed by my recantation? To carry on working, I have to go to Holland. I oh, see. 
Fedazzoni is grinding lenses again in some shop in Milan. Of course. No Latin, poor man. Our little monk has given up research and returned to the bosom of the church. Yes. My superiors are working on my own spiritual recovery. I am making far better progress than was first thought. Indeed. The Lord be praised. Virginia, will you go and see to those geese? I don't trust that man. He's harmless, you heard them. Come out, I need help with the geese. I have to travel all night to get to the frontier in the morning. May I leave now? Why did you come here? Huh? Were you trying to upset me? Was that the point? I learned to think cautiously, but even now I sometimes fall back. I had no wish to excite you. Barberini called it the itch. He himself was never quite rid of it. Huh? Oh, okay. I've been writing again. Writing? Yeah, I've finished the discorsi. Mechanics and the law of falling bodies. Uh, you finished it. Uh, oh, well, uh, they let me have paper and quills out, idiots. They know I cannot be cured of my sins overnight. So they lock it away as I write it. I don't believe you. What did you say? It's like writing on water. It makes a mockery of what you do. How can you bear to? Oh, well, I'm a slave of old habits. You give the discourse to the monks. When in London and Prague and Amsterdam, people are desperate to have them. Well, yeah, from Amsterdam, that's easily said. Two new branches of science as good as destroyed. Well, it may please Fabricius and all the others to know that I have risked my few remaining comforts by making a copy, yet behind my own back, as it were, at night, by moonlight, every night for the past six months. You have a copy? My vanity has not allowed me to destroy it. Where is it? <sighs> The copy is in the globe. <gasps> the Discorsi! Now, if you were to risk taking that to Holland, then, of course, that would be entirely your own affair. Mm -hmm. You could always say you bought it from someone who had access to the original in the Holy Office, something like that. My project is to establish an entirely new science in an old subject, motion. By experiment, I have managed to discover some of its properties which it is worthwhile to know. Well, I had to pass the time somehow. Oh, this will found a new physics. Stuff it under your coat. And we thought that you were a traitor. I was the bitterest critic you had. And you were right. I taught you physics, and I denied the truth. But this changes everything, everything. Does it? You conceal the truth from the enemy. Even in the field of ethics, you were a thousand years ahead of us. Was I? Well, like everyone, we said, you know, he will die, but he will never recant. You replied, I have recanted, but I shall live. But your hands are tainted, we said. You say, better tainted than empty. Better <laughs> tainted than empty. <laughs> yeah, sounds realistic. Sounds like me. Well... New science, new ethics. I, of all people, ought to have known. I was 11 years old when you passed off another man's telescope as your own. And yet, oh. what use you then put it to? Well, all your friends shook their heads when you kowtowed to a small child in Florence. But my God, science then really caught on. You always laughed at the idea of heroes. Suffering bores me, you said. <laughs> Suffering comes from failure of strategy. And, allowing for obstacles, the shortest line between two points may be the longest way around. I remember. God, when you recanted, I should have realised you had a reason. You wanted to get on with the real work of science. Which is? The study of the properties of motion. The mother of machines, which will make the Earth a much better place. Uh-huh. <laughs> You wrote a book which only you could write. If you'd been burnt as a martyr, then they would have won. They did win. And there is no scientific book that only one man can write. Why did you recant, then? I recanted because I feared physical pain. No. They showed me the instruments. So you had no strategy? <sighs> None. 
science knows only one commandment contribute to science yeah, i think i can say i've done that Welcome to the gutter, brother in science, cousin in treachery. You eat fish, I've got fish. But it's not the fish stinking, it's me. I sell out. And you, you're ready to buy. Oh, oh, the book. <laughs> Just one look at the book, the sacred object. And suddenly now, your mouth is watering and all your curses fall away. Ah, oh, the great Babylonian, the murderous cow, the scarlet woman opens her thighs and everything changes. Blessed be our whitewashing, death-fearing community. Fearing death is human. Human weakness has nothing to do with science. You think not? My dear Andrea, even as I now am, I think I may tell you a little about the science to which you have given your life. In my spare time, of which, after all, I have a great deal, I've lately fallen to thinking of how the world of science, to which I no longer belong, will one day judge me. The pursuit of science seems to me to demand a particular courage Science is knowledge won through doubt. By giving knowledge of everything to everyone, we seek to make skeptics of the world, and this new art of doubt has enchanted the public. They've snatched the telescopes out of our hands and tried to turn them onto their tormentors, but we have not helped. The movement of the stars has become clearer, but to the mass of the people, the movement of their rulers is still incalculable so what are we working for i take it the only purpose of science is to relieve the hardship of life if scientists intimidated by power are happy to amass knowledge for its own sake then science itself will be crippled your new machines will only mean new hardships oh yes you may discover all there is to discover but your progress will be progress away from mankind the gulf between you and the people will become so great that one day you will cry out with joy over some new achievement and you will be answered by a cry of universal horror. <sighs> I, uh, I had a moment here. I had a chance. In my time, astronomy reached down to the streets. In these quite extraordinary circumstances, the courage of one man could have changed the world if I had resisted, if I had said no. Then scientists might have had a Hippocratic oath of their own. They might have promised their gifts to mankind. But instead, I fathered a race of inventive dwarfs who can be hired for anything. Oh, Andrea, I was never in danger. I know that now. For those few years, I was as strong as the authorities. And I gave my knowledge to those in power to use or misuse as they wished. I betrayed my profession. A man who does what I have done cannot be tolerated in the ranks of science. You have been received into the ranks of the faithful. Correct. I'm going to eat now. We lock up at eight. Uh, I am glad I came. You're a teacher yourself now. How could you bear to shake my hand? Someone passing through has sent some geese. I still love to eat. So you no longer believe a new age has dawned? <laughs> a new age has dawned, all right. You be careful as you go through Germany with the truth under your coat. What you were saying 
about that writer. I have to tell you, I don't share your view. I don't know how to answer you. But I don't think that will be the last word. Thank you, senor. We don't welcome visitors from the past. They upset him. Uh, any idea who sent those geese? Not Andrea. Uh, maybe not. What's the night like? Clear. Customs. Uh, open your bags, please. Papers. Let me see. Where are you heading? Switzerland. What's this book you're carrying? Look. It's in Latin. Here. Let him through. In David Hare's version of The Life of Galileo by Bertolt Brecht, the part of Galileo was played by Richard Griffiths. Bernard Hepton played Cardinal Barberini, John Moffat, the Inquisitor, and Maurice Denham, the Old Cardinal. Andrea was played by Stephen Tompkinson, and the young Andrea by Daniel Waters. Virginia was Natasha Pine, Signora Sarti, Jill Graham, Ludovico, Andrew Branch, the Little Monk, Mark Lambert, and Federzoni, George A. Cooper. David Collings played Cardinal Bellarmin, Gavin Muir, Sagredo, Derek Waring, the Chancellor, Peter Howell, the Philosopher, and Ian Masters, the Mathematician. Jonathan Keeble was Cosimo, Benjamin Guy, Cosimo as a boy, Michael Tudor Barnes, Signor Vanni, and Oliver Senton, a monk. The music was composed by Jonathan Dove, and the boy singer was Connor Burrows. The director was Janet Whitaker. David Hare's script was first commissioned by the Almeida Theatre Company. <laughs>